Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar, and today we're going to talk about the Gershgorin Circle Theorem, an interesting theorem in linear algebra that gives you estimates on where the eigenvalues of a matrix lie. And it has interesting consequences in proving the invertibility of certain classes of matrices, and also bounds on eigenvalues for other classes. So the theorem states something like this. You have a matrix A that's n by n with complex entries. And now we're going to use it to construct some disks. The i of disk is going to be in the complex plane centered at the point AII from the matrix, whose radius is going to be the sum of the absolute values of the other entries in the ith row of your matrix. And the theorem states that the eigenvalues of your given matrix A lie in the union of these disks. So before getting into the proof of this, which actually has a surprisingly quite short proof, I want to give an example so you get a sense of what this is like. So here is a matrix A with entries in the complex numbers. They happen to be real. Let's write down what these disks are and then look at the region in which the eigenvalues must lie. So first of all, D1 is the set of points in the complex plane such that the absolute value or the magnitude of z minus this number here, which is 5, is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of the other entries in the first row. In that case, this is going to be 0 0.1 plus 1.1, which is 1.2. Okay, disk 2, which will have similar formulation, will have the points where z minus 6 is less than or equal to 3.1, and then for D3, we'll have the points in the complex plane for which Z minus 2 is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of these two, which is 0 0.5. So what this says then is that if we draw the complex plane, we look at these points, 5, 6, and 2. 2 is maybe somewhere over here, 5 over here, and then 6 over here. And we draw corresponding disks. So Around 2, we have a disk of radius 0 0.5. Around the point 0.5, we have a disk of radius 1.2, so it's going to engulf 6, but not touch 2. And then around 6, we have a circle of radius 3.1, so that'll look something like maybe this. Then, the eigenvalues of the matrix A have to lie somewhere in this circle, the union of these circles. Okay, so let's give a proof of this theorem to get a sense of why it's true. And then see some interesting consequences of it. All right, so say we had an eigenvalue lambda then that means that there's a corresponding eigenvector x, so ax is lambda x. Now if we look at the ith component of each of these things, here we'd get lambda x sub i. And then on the right hand side, we'd have the dot product of the ith row of a with the vector x. So that'll look something like the sum j equals 1 to n, a i j, so we're running through all of the entries in the ith row of a times x sub j. Now one of these indices where j runs from 1 to n is going to be i itself and we'll have a i i as a coefficient. So let's move that one over. If we do that we'll have lambda minus a i i times x i is the sum j not equal to i of a i j xj. All right. Now, if we look in terms of the modulus of these quantities, we get as a consequence that lambda minus aii in modulus times the modulus of xi is by the triangle inequality less than or equal to the sum j not equal to i of a i j in modulus times x j in modulus. All right. 
The thing we're trying to figure out is where this lambda lies. And we kind of have a situation where we've, we're comparing the distance from lambda to AII like we have in these disks. So it seems like we're doing something that's close to what we want. All right, so next thing we'll do here is we'll pick I strategically. So this is true for any I. So pick I so that it has, or it is the coordinate with largest modulus in X. Now since X is an eigenvector, there's gonna be at least one component of X that's non-zero, so we can definitely pick something where this is largest. All right, so if we do that, and divide by this modulus of xi, then what we have is that the modulus of lambda minus aii is the sum of these entries here. And now because x sub i was chosen so that its modulus is largest, all of these quantities here are less than or equal to one. And so this thing is less than or equal to the sum j equal, not equal to i of the modulus of aij. Okay, so it's definitely the case then that this eigenvalue is gonna live in one of these disks. And as a consequence, it's gonna be in the union of all these disks. All right, so we have the proof of this theorem, but of course, a question is, why does this theorem matter and what does it give to you? So I wanna look at an example of a particular matrix to get a sense of what happens. So here's one interesting consequence of this theorem. Let's write down a particular matrix that looks similar to the matrix that we had at the beginning. Okay, so let's look at the disks where the eigenvalues must lie. The first one is points where z minus five in absolute value is less than or equal to uh, 1.2. Then we have z minus six less than or equal to 2.6. And then we have z minus two less than or equal to 1.1, 1.2. So if you look in the complex plane at these things, so we have a two, a five, and a six here, if we look at this point here, or this disk here, it's centered at z equals five, and it has radius 1.2, right? So no matter where it is, it's gonna look something like this, um, or in fact, it actually engulfs six, so it looks something more like that. This disk will not touch the origin whatsoever. The origin will be contained in it. In fact, none of these disks have the or origin inside of them because the points that we have are further from the origin than the radius we're considering. So zero can't possibly be an eigenvalue of this matrix. So as a consequence, this matrix can't possibly be singular, meaning that this matrix has to be an invertible matrix. And the reason is because a matrix is invertible if and only if zero is not an eigenvalue. So this generalizes a bit more. If you have a matrix in which the diagonal entries are real and any diagonal entry is larger in absolute value than the sum of its off diagonal entries, the Gersh-Gorin circle theorem tells you that such a matrix has to be invertible. This is cool, especially for something like numerical linear algebra, because if you sort of perturb these values ever so slightly and your original matrix is invertible, the matrix you end up with, if it has this property that these entries are quite larger than the sum of the off diagonal entries will still be invertible. Okay, let's look at another example of one of the consequences of this. one that is motivated by statistics. 
So in statistics, you often consider things called stochastic matrices, which are matrices whose rows are probability vectors, or in other words, whose rows are non-negative and have sum equal to one. So say we had such a matrix like this, Notice the row sums here are 1. Let's think about what the Gershgorin circle theorem will tell us. So as an example from the first row, one of the disks that we have is the disk z minus 0.6 is less than or equal to 0.4. Okay, so what does this mean? If we have the point 0.6 over here, then the first disk looks like this with zero, this radius being 0 0.4, meaning this point right here is a one. As a consequence, any point that lies in this disk has value at most one if it's real. Another way to word it for complex numbers is this modulus is at most one. And the same thing happens with every single one of these other disks. So another consequence of this interesting theorem is that any matrix that is stochastic has eigenvalues at most one in absolute value or in modulus. So these are just two examples of really cool and interesting consequences of this theorem that comes sort of directly by analyzing what it means to be an eigenvalue of a matrix and using that to get explicit bounds on how far complex numbers that are eigenvalues are from the diagonal entries of the matrix. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, click the like button. If you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.